As we look around the world today, we see horrendous violence in the Middle East. We see Russia invading Ukraine and threatening its neighbors. And we see a growing desire by many to identify by sect, ethnicity, and ideology over any shared sense of nationhood. We wonder, is this just the worst instincts of human nature that we repeat generation after generation? Or can we change our behavior? Can we move away from these destructive mindsets to live more peacefully with our communities and ourselves? I've spent the last 25 years working on conflict and reconciliation around the world, and I want to tell you about two incredible individuals who did change. Rolf Meyer was Minister of Defense during apartheid in South Africa. David Irvine was a loyalist or Protestant paramilitary in Northern Ireland. These two men experienced a profound transformation that not only liberated them from destructive mindsets and behaviors, but through their transformation helped liberate millions from violence and repression. And through their story, we'll see that profound change is indeed possible. I met Rolf in 1994 when I invited him to Belfast to help share his experience in helping end apartheid with leaders there who were struggling with change. Rolf was a very uh, senior politician in South Africa. Everybody thought he would be the next president. He actually grew up thinking that apartheid was not only good for whites, but for blacks as well. He built his entire career in the service of the apartheid state. But along the way, something happened to him. He came to realize that the system he served and defended was corrupt, immoral, and had to end. David Irvine spent a decade in prison. Many people called him a terrorist. I later came to call him a friend. He joined the UVF paramilitaries when, as a young teenager, another teenager of the same age and same last name was killed by an IRA bomb. David felt that everything that he and his community stood for was under mortal threat. He felt that the best defense was a good offense. But like Rolf, something happened to David. He came to realize that the grievance and fear that justified the use of violence against his neighbors had become a vicious trap. He had gone from killing to live to living to kill and had to find a way to break out of that. How did David and Rolf get to that point? When Rolf was Minister of Defense, he interviewed a young ANC combatant, and he asked him, why did you join the guerrilla movement? The young man told him that when he was a young child, his family worked for an Afrikaner farmer. And one day, while sitting in the back of the farmer's pickup truck with the farmer's dog, it started to rain heavily. The farmer got out, got out of the car, went in the back and took the dog and put it in the cabin and left the young child in the downpour. This unbelievable disregard for another human being, a young child, so shocked Rolf that he began to question the very system he served and defended. David Irvine told me that he and his other loyalist prisoners learned Irish in prison so they could understand what the IRA prisoners were saying. In time, he came to understand that he had more in common with these working-class Catholics than many in his own community. He felt that their shared experience of exclusion was a far deeper bond than what divided them as Catholics and Protestants. David and Rolf shared a journey in which they realized they were stuck in mindsets that had to end. Rolf went on to convince F.W. de Klerk to release Nelson Mandela from prison and he led the negotiations to end apartheid. David Irvine became a principal negotiator, and as former Senator George Mitchell said, helped bring the loyalist paramilitaries out of the dark ages into peace. Is their story unusual? Over these 25 years, I've come to believe that while every country will have its own unique experience with conflict and repression, people respond to those experiences as humans. It's the same around the world. I know from my own experience what fear, rejection, and humiliation feels like. These emotions know no geographic boundaries. Being bullied by your schoolmates is biologically and fundamentally no different 
than being humiliated in Belfast or Johannesburg. In fact, neuroscience is now showing us that we are deeply emotional beings, that we need to feel safe and acknowledged to engage fully in the world. Our brain processes are deeply unconscious. They blend emotion and cognition in the service of survival. Our brains are plastic, they can change, and we can overcome deep-seated fear, bias, and trauma to live more peacefully within ourselves and within our, our own communities. This is a universal experience. Some recent findings in neuroscience help illustrate this very powerfully. And I believe that we can begin to take what we're finding, match it with experience, and begin to address the challenges we face in the world. A number of years ago, some social scientists discovered the concept of sacred values. Those values that help shape our core identity, they're really important to who we are. For some, it could be a deep religious belief, the protection of one's child, or a deep love of country. Neuroimaging is now showing us that we process sacred values in different regions of the brain than cost-benefit calculations, that we respond with moral outrage, show aggression, and hold on more deeply to those sacred values when we feel they're under threat. To millions of Americans, the Second Amendment is a deeply felt sacred value. It's core to their identity. It helps shape who they are in the world. It's not just about the right to bear arms. It's tied to notions of freedom, heritage, and the ability to protect what's really important to them. Let's look what happened after Sandy Hook. Rather than seeing an increase in gun control across the country, we've seen a loosening of gun legislation. And many believers in the Second Amendment responded with outrage. They became aggressive, and they held on to those sacred beliefs more deeply. And with what we know about sacred values, this shouldn't be a surprise. It was a core threat to their identity. We are more polarized on this issue than ever. And the question is, can we apply what neuroscience is telling us about sacred values to this issue? What research shows us is that sacred values have to be recognized. We have to let somebody know that we acknowledge how important this is to them. We don't have to share those sacred values, but we do have to acknowledge that they exist and they are important to that individual. Only then can we get to common ground. Only then can that individual not feel that what is sacred to them is under threat. And we can begin to have a conversation about one of, this, or one of these most difficult issues. When we look at the world around us and we wonder, can we change? We can look at other insights that neuroscience is providing us. When we look at the rise of ISIS, in Iraq and Syria, we wonder how did this small group of fanatics rise so quickly and take, a, take over so many large segments of this country, of Iraq and then Syria? They could not have gotten there on their own. They could not have done that unless they tapped into the humiliation, exploitation, and exclusion that many Sunnis felt under the Shia-dominated government of Prime Minister Maliki. I know from my own experience that exclusion is the main driver of conflict. When we feel excluded, we don't feel safe. When we feel excluded, we feel that we can't really engage to do what is normal to us, for ourselves and for our communities. And now we have a biological basis for exclusion. Some recent neuroimaging shows that we experience social rejection as physical pain. But that part of our brain that registers trauma cannot fully differentiate between emotional and physical trauma. We share that with other mammals. Think of that animal that's pulled from the safety of the herd by a predator. That's a direct threat to their survival. And we experience that the same way. Our capacity to think rationally is dependent on feeling safe. 
So when we think of these challenges in the world, it's important to remember that we have to recognize what drives this behavior. When I think of David Irvine, he said to me, terrorists have to come from somewhere. And inclusion, exclusion and injustice is a powerful place to come from. David went on to say that he felt that his capacity to protect what was sacred to him and his community, his religion and being British, could only be fully realized in a country that recognized what was sacred to those around him. Rolf Meyer came to see that a system built on exclusion would never last. What this tells us is that we have to build relationships and governments of inclusion. Without that, we will drive more and more of our communities into violence and division. As we look around the world and we see deepening conflict, increasing division, and we may grow with despair, I think it's important to keep in mind that people can change, that people can fundamentally change. And to see someone like David and to see someone like Rolf is empowering and liberating. We now know that we can rewire our brains, that change is possible, and by combining what we know with these insights and with practice, we can begin to reframe the challenges we face in the world, and I believe begin to live in a more peaceful world. Thank you very much.